Hello again, everybody. This is Tim Kraus. I'm uh, pleased to come back to you very quickly after I, I did part three of cultish behavior. This is part four of cultish behavior here. We're going to we're going to have some discussion today. We're going to have a lot of videos because cultish behavior really depends on uh, people behaving in such a way as to meet these characteristics or meet these attributes. Um, it's, it's interesting. I've been doing these videos, getting a lot of response, and I've been watching some of the response from folks like Donnie Reagan, some of the other ministers, and there are some that take this very, very, very personally. I need to let them know. I need to let everybody know this is not personal about Donnie Reagan. I this is as has very little to do with Donnie Reagan. It does have a lot to do with William Branham, and uh, and Donnie uh, and I understand why Donnie would assume it upon himself to take it personally. If you assume it, if you assume that this is a personal attack on Donnie, then you don't have to talk about William Branham or or how the things that William Branham did have in any way uh, been incorrect. You see, if, if Donnie says this is a personal attack on him or other ministers, then it leaves William Branham in the clear. That's just not the case. The case is this is all about William Branham, folks. This is about how William Branham and the followers of William Branham in this particular series act as though they are involved in a cult. Now, I know they don't like the word cult, and William Branham said time and time again, this is not a cult. We're not a cult. And I know that ministers say, we're not a cult. People call us a cult, we're not a cult. But you can see through those behaviors, and we're going to see that again today uh, in the two areas that we're going to address, the characteristics of a cult that we're going to address today. First things first, let's take a look at the definition of a cult from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. A system of religious veneration and devotion directed toward a particular figure or object and below that, a misplaced or excessive admiration for a particular personal person or thing, like a cult of personality surrounding the leaders. In this section, we and we touched a little bit about this in, in video number three or in part three of this series, we are going to address separation from the church. We're also going to address today seeking inappropriate loyalty to their leaders. And I've left you links, by the way, as always, study notes, all the links, all the video links down to my Google Drive right down here in the description block. Go ahead and just the, just to make sure that you understand, none of the video clips were edited to be nefarious. They are all just uh, extracts from video clips that we've received from different people. So uh, just let you know, it's all down here in the description. Now, the first thing we want to address, though, is the separation from the church. I want to address, first of all, it's important for us to remember what William Branham said. You sitting in here in front, you believe me to be God's prophet because he tells everybody, and, and we get a lot of questions from people saying, you know, why are you picking on William Branham? He always pointed to God. He never pointed to himself. He always pointed to God, a humble guy, you know, never said he was a prophet, always said, you know, everybody else you know, what said that I'm a prophet, but he never pointed to himself, always pointed to Jesus Christ. Well, let's see what he actually said. Okay. Here we have William Branham. This is a 1959. This is August the 12th. You sitting here in the front, you believe me to be God's prophet. A prophet is a messenger to an age. You believe I have God's message. So he's asking people, don't you believe that that's true? Here is, he is again in 1964. This is January the 12th. The word, the word in the days of the apostles does not work in this day. In other words, what William Branham says in that clip is the Bible is meaningless. If the word in the days of the apostles doesn't work in this day, then all of the epistles and all of the letters that were written by Paul, James, uh, Peter, uh, all, all of those letters are, are to no effect that the word in the days of the apostle does not work in this day. Therefore, you need William Branham's message. And that, as we saw before, talks about, as an example, when we talked about other attributes of the cult, that basically elevates what William Branham says above the Bible. So whether you want to believe it or not, or whether you want to admit to it or not, if you believe everything that William Branham said, and you believe what he, what I just read to you, that the word in the days of the apostle does not work in this day, then, then you elevate William Branham's word above the Bible. 
just just a tip. Here's another one in 1964. This is August the 16th. Only the ones that's been made part of this word, C, will be their part and their position in this word for their age, will be the only one will be there. So Branham's saying, in order to get to heaven, you have to be part of this message. You, you've got to be part of the bride. And we're going to see message ministers repeat that very thing. The word of the Lord comes, this is in 1965, this is January the 24th by William Branham. The word of the Lord comes to the prophet and him only. That is the word that's spoken for that day is made manifest by the prophet in that age, always has been. Again, William Branham saying, if you don't believe me in my message, then you don't have the word for your day. And all of that scripture is null and void. So here we have William Branham in 1965. This is April the 18th, the morning service. It is the rising of the sun, waving of the sheaf. What was the sheaf? The first one that come to mature. The first one that proved it was a wheat. The, it, that proved it was a sheaf. Hallelujah. I'm sure you see what I'm talking about. It was waved over the people. And the first time there will come forth for the bride age... For a resurrection out of a dark denominationalism will be a message that the full maturity of the word is turned back again in its full power and being waved over the people by the same signs and wonders that he did back there. So what William Branham is telling us here is you're seeing the signs and wonders that I do. I do the signs and wonders and that leads you to believe or that should lead you to believe or understand at any rate that, that that's the message for the bride age. That's the full maturity of the word. Here we have 1965. Uh, this is uh, August the 1st. This is a morning service. Now, the humble little bride of Christ just simply believes the word. Whoever she is, it's individuals. I hope and trust that there's many setting present, many listening in. And I hope that myself and every one you, of you all are part of that bride. So here we're segregating the bride. We see the idea that there's the church and then there's the bride, the church and the bride. Donnie Reagan talks about this frequently. We've shown videos of him talking about that before, as do other ministers. The issue is, is there really a separation of the church and the bride in Scripture? Well, we're going to see that. I hope many, and it will, with all that's been ordained to that will be that because it's their nature. They see the word can only recognize the word. It can't recognize a denomination or a perversion. It knows better. It's the word. So what he's saying is the denominations are those people that have the common salvation through Jesus Christ. They're not it. What has to be it is if you're the bride of Christ. So we're going to separate. We're going to elevate ourselves again. We're going to become an elite. We're going to elevate ourselves again. That goes back to the characteristics that talks about uh, extra scriptural or, or anti scriptural or extra, extra scriptural teaching within a cult. Now, what scripture does William Branham use to establish this assertion? He's going to rely really heavily, as do the message ministers, on Matthew 25, and he's going to focus this very narrowly on verses 7 through 10. I'll read starting in verse 7. Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps, but the foolish ones said to the sensible ones, Give us some of your oil, because our lamps are going out. The sensible ones answered, No, there won't be enough for us. And for you, go instead to those who sell and buy oil for yourselves. When they had gone to buy some, the groom arrived. Then those who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Branham uses this to separate. You're a foolish version if you're a denomination. You're a wise version if you're a message believer and in the bride. That's the that's the the proof text that that Branham uses. We're going to take a look at some other, uh, so what some ministers say to back this up, or what some ministers say to, to support that assertion. We're going to start with Ron Peterson. An interesting clip here. Ron's all about, it's okay if you leave the message, but just keep your mouth shut. We're going to see that. And right after that, and I'll play these back to back. Then right after that, we're going to see Barry Coffey on uh, August the 22nd, 2021, Jew or Bride. By the way, the Ron Peterson message was the 1st of January, 2022. 
Then we're going to see Donnie Reagan. He speaks on the 5th of January, 2022, Nehemiah and his letters. And we're going to see Ron Peterson again, uh, January the 1st, 2022. He's going to talk about royal seed. Then we're going to see Tom Ray. This is the 2021, December 8th. Without the message, there is no rapture. Abe Pennard, now this is going, This Abe Pennard, we're going to see him. This is October the 14th, 2021. Our church is different. Then we're going to see Donna Ray, Donnie Reagan again. This is uh, going back a little bit. This is April the 28th, 2021. There will be no rapture without Malachi 4. So we're going to take a look at those, and then we're going to come back and address that. We're going to look at that for just a moment. So here we go with those videos. I'll play them back to back for you. Here we are. So then you have within this message, which is a revival. Can we say amen? amen. And we're involved in it. But then there is a Ishmael that looks and acts, huh? Like he's a believer until the time comes. He goes against the true believers. Amen. He turns away from the message. He, they, they, they write their ungodly things on the internet. And he was wrong here. And he was wrong there. And hey, listen, if you don't like this message and it ain't for you, go ahead and go. But keep your mouth shut. Amen. To me, you need to be either a Jew in Israel, that's the, con that's the border you need to be within, or you need to be a member of the bride and within that border. And to me, we're coming down to the only two safe places on the planet. The rest of the nations are fit to burn. Dear Nehemiah, I am going to post your notes on YouTube. I am going to show people this letter that I sent you. And if you don't answer me, I'm going to call you a coward. Now you all know I ain't making this up. I'm preaching from experience. Oh, she's a hard teacher. So I will give you so many days. Oh yeah, that's the way the devil likes to do you. If you don't shut your mouth testifying about your healing, you don't shut up about testifying about God's going to move for you, and you know you're worse shape than you've ever been in your life, I'm giving you so many days to shut up. Well, devil, go ahead and give me that and that many more, because I ain't shutting up. Of the seed of Abraham, even of God gene, there are two groups. One is going to be called the royal seed, the elect seed, the super seed. Saints, this message came through a prophet to put you in a rapture. If you don't accept this message, there is no rapture. Now, he sent a message, I believe, in our day. Say, what makes us different from other churches? Don't we all believe in Calvary and then Jesus, the Lamb that took away the sin of the world and that he's our Savior and all these things? Sure we do. But then he sends a message to make himself manifest in the now, not just 2,000 years ago, but right today. And that message is what connects you to the Christ of the present tense. Right. Yeah. Oh, so I don't need John the Baptist. You'll never come to Jesus Amen. unless you come this way. Amen. May I update it for you and bring it up a little bit closer. You'll never go in the rapture without the ministration of Malachi 4. Oh, so I don't need William Branham. That's what you think. Okay, there we have it. Now, you've seen each one of those ministers talk about, with the exception of Ron Peterson, I showed that one about the leave but keep your mouth shut. I, I showed that because it's interesting. Apparently, criticism is not welcome there. 
Uh, and and actually, truth can't be truth unless you're able to question it and examine it and look at it. But let's ignore that for just a moment. All the rest of these clips, uh, the Barry Coffey, the, the Ron Peterson, the Royal Seed, the Donnie Reagan, the Tom Ray, the Apenard, all of those clips speak specifically about separating the message of William Branham from the rest of the church. And what is our cultish behavior that we're highlighting here? The sixth cultish behavior that we see is separation from the church. Here we see great examples of we're better than that. We're elite. We're exalted above all, all of the rest of the church. We are separate from the church. So obviously that fits into the cultish behaviors. Just it just it's obvious that it fits into the cultish behaviors. Now we're going to look at number seven here. Seven is seeking inappropriate loyalty to their leaders. And boy, have we got some stuff here. Lots and lots of message ministers will talk about William Branham. Okay. And they, and, and I'm going to show you some pretty shocking things as it relates to inappropriate loyalty to leadership. But let's take a look. First video we're going to see is Barry Coffey. This is April the 5th, 2021. I'm going to call this Prophet for This Time. Then we got Donnie Reagan. Uh, October 20th, 2021, God chose William Branham to fulfill Malachi 4. Then I've got Donnie Reagan, uh, November the 29th, 2020. You are in trouble if you question a prophet. And then finally, Tim Pruitt, that's uh, January the 9th, 2022. He's going to talk about Billy Graham. Boy, is he going to dish dirt on Billy Graham. So we'll see those four videos back to back to back. Now, I, I just want to make mention, by the way, Fulfillment of Malachi 4, lots of videos that we have. Take a look at the BTS YouTube channel. I did one specifically on a study on what was Malachi 4 and how did that relate to Gentiles and Christianity. So take a look at that if you have any questions about Malachi 4. But let's go ahead and take a look at these videos so that we can see what's going on. Let's roll those now. So bear with me. Here we go. So here are the people now, like I said, you can get online and find Bible studies that ask the question, is there, a pro is there such a thing as a prophet uh, for the times we're living in? And uh, what are the signs of a coming world order and so forth? Hey, I'm not going back to that. I'm not going back to that question. I'm not going back to that uh, point and asking the question, has there been a prophet? There has been a prophet. We've been there, done that. We know that for a fact. And we know what he said. We know what he's given to us. We know what scriptures apply to our day that do not apply uh, to other ages, but they apply specifically to our. And he was just a plain old Kentucky guy. Only went to the seventh grade. But God used this man because it was his choice to fulfill Malachi 4. I don't like it. Don't make a better difference. God never asked if you did. On this, Brother Louis, there's no, thus saith the Lord after each verse. No, thus saith the Lord after each statement. Now, the same prophet would come over and say, thus saith the Lord, I'll do this, and I'll show you a sign. Well, they could take that as thus saith the Lord. But sometimes prophets would just be saying words, and they wouldn't say, thus saith the Lord. And others would look at it and say, well, that was probably just his opinion. Well, it could have been, but it might not have been. Well, you could be in big trouble if you think it was his opinion when actually it was the word of the Lord. Now, we find that even in the day, of course, that we're living in, as people want to uh, do our message exactly the same way. Now, Brother Branham talked about Billy Graham. He calls him by name. He said he's the son of Kish. You see, he was never called of God. He was never out of the right tribe. He was educated, head and shoulder above all others, a fine man, a challenger of evangelism, and a Mohammedan cha challenged him. And when the Mohammedan challenged him and said, if your God is God, let him heal the sick like he said he would do. And the son of Kish with the rest of the army quietened himself, left the country defeated. Amen. It's a disgrace. Our God is God. One of the sons of Kish, head and shoulders above all the other evangelists, called by Muhammad that other day, challenged to the word of God, trembled in his shoes and left the ground. 
What's the matter? It's something besides theology. It has to bring the supernatural power of God and do it. He knew nothing about it, same as in the days of Saul. Okay, there we are with the videos. And you can clearly see that William Branham is revered above everybody. He is absolutely revered as the prophet of God. You can see that. Although we've demonstrated time and time and time again where William Branham doesn't qualify as a prophet of God, but we'll leave that alone for the moment. Here we have the ministers talking about William Branham and how he is a prophet for our age, that he is the one that was sent by God uh, to lead the bride, the elite group, uh, into heaven. So, uh, But what did William Branham say about himself? Now, that's an interesting idea. Because remember, everybody tells us, oh, William Branham was just a simple guy. He never pointed to himself. He always pointed to Jesus. Well, let's see. And I left a link here in the study notes to the Believe the Sign webpage. There's an article uh, that that's titled View of Himself. So you can go ahead and click that link. It'll get you straight to the article. And, but 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 this these are interesting quotes directly from William Branham. Now, this is 1965, April the 27th, as God changes mind. William Branham speaks. Now, Jesus came in three names, Son of Man, which is a prophet, Son of God, which went through the church age, then Son of David. I'm going to break here for just a moment. Son of Man is not... He, that that's not identified as a prophet. The Son of Man is only used by God or by Jesus about himself. It's used from time to time in the Old Testament to refer to Jesus Christ, but Jesus uses it towards himself. He speaks about the Son of Man, and it's a deprecating sort of, of uh, phrase to use for himself he could have said as an example son of god because he's the son of god he's jesus he's the messiah but he uses the son of man and he's the only one that uses the son of man none of the disciples or apostles use the term son of man unless they are referring to jesus christ jesus is the son of man and Branham speaks about it here, son of man, although he talks about the son of man, which is a prophet. So he speaks about Jesus Christ as a prophet. Well, Jesus Christ was the Messiah. I'm sure he had some prophetic uh, characteristics or some prophetic attributes. You can count on that. But the son of man does not refer to Jesus Christ as a prophet. Okay. Okay. So, j j because it's important because message believers want to then say, well, the Son of Man refers to William Branham. That's the type of William, the type Son of Man is the same as, you know, the Jesus Christ that's referred to as a prophetic because this is where they get that saying. And it's not scriptural and it's untrue. And if you study the way Jesus used that term, you will understand why that's not true. But let's go on. Now, Jesus came in three names, son of man, which is prophet. We just talked about that. Son of God, which went through the church age, then son of David. But in between the son of God and son of David, according to his own word and according to Malachi 4 and many scriptures, he's to return back into his church in physical form, in the people, in a human beings, in the way of being a prophet, see? So here William Branham says, hey, I'm the prophet of God. Remember those things that we read a little bit earlier where he said, do you believe me to be the prophet of God? Well, here William Branham is saying, Jesus Christ is going to return back into his church in physical form as a prophet. It's no wonder that message believers and message ministers misconstrue and say, but William Branham was a prophet of God. He was also the manifestation of Jesus on earth. Here is where they get that from, because William Branham tells us this, that, that God is going to return back to his church in physical form as a prophet. And he said, I'm a prophet of God. So William Branham's completely out of his lane here. He's completely out of, out of his lane. But there are lots of churches, Lee Vale churches particularly, that basically are the Christ Branham. Christ J Branham was the manifestation of Jesus Christ on earth. And they point to this message passage to tell them that that's true. So that William Branham taught that, by the way. He didn't, and he, did he point to Jesus Christ there? Not much, huh? Here he is. Now, this is uh, Obey the Voice of the Angel. 
this is in July the 13th in 1960. So here's William Branham, and he says, Now you could be a renowned Christian and fail to believe what I've told you to be the truth, and you'd never be able to re reap a bit of benefit from it. Now, I'm sorry to have to say that, but it's the truth. When Jesus went on, was on earth, the people that killed him believed in God the Father and were great worshipers of God. Is that right? But he could not help them because they did not believe in him. Is that right? And he said with his own mouth, as you have believed in God, believe also in me. Is that, is that right? Now, if you believed in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I want you to believe that he sent me here to pray for you, and he will testify whether or not he, he, or he has or not. And if he testifies, then you believe it. So here we have William Branham remarkably saying, hey, look, if you don't believe what I'm telling you, you can't really reap any of the benefit. If you don't believe in me as a prophet of God, as if Branham is the one who heals and not God. Here we have William Branham, 1953. This is June the 11th. Show us the Father and it'll satisfy us. This is from Connersville, Indiana. Now, He's relating a story. He, and This is Branham speaking. She said, Reverend Branham, if I want somebody talk to me about like that, I'll get somebody that's got some sense, not you. I said, very well. I've done all I can do. Remember, sister, if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you'll never be saved. Is Branham intimating here that by not believing in William Branham that you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit? See, this is where message believers say, well, you turned away from the message, therefore you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit, and you're never going to, you forfeited your right to the kingdom of God. So we see the message sermons that William Branham taught that people take, and they say, oh, this must mean that because you've left the message, now you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, and you've lost your inheritance to the kingdom of God, which is just nonsense, total nonsense. We've never left the message. Or we, as I should say, we've never left God. We left the idea that William Branham is this prophet that William Branham is speaking about here, and that the the prophet that we saw the message ministers talk about. But we never left God. Here now is William Branham, 1953. This is the 7th of November. How the angel came to me, Owensboro, Kentucky, Saturday service. Now I I believe that. It was born as, as a prophetic utterance. Oh, many people call it one thing and another thing and so forth. I don't know what it is, just so the Lord loves me and I love him and settles it with me. Don't have to be anything. Call it anything, just so it gets the results for the Lord Jesus and for his people. That's the main thing. It's caused many others, Brother Roberts for one. He's talking about Oral Roberts. Brother Jaggers, most of all of them have come set right where you're set. And they seen the Lord working. It inspired their faith and said, here we go. And they went out and done something for the Lord. I hope there's 50 comes out of this meeting the same way. That's right. Go out and do something. It's all for the kingdom of God, all for his glory. Here William Branham tells us that he was born a prophet. He was born a prophet. Okay. Here we have another message from William Branham. This is 1965. This is July the 11th. It's called Ashamed, Jefferson, Indiana, Jeffersonville, Indiana. If you notice the prophet in one sense of the word in the Old Testament, when he says, thus saith the Lord, now watch him, he goes right into the phrase of taking the place of the Lord. You notice when he placed out before him, thus saith the Lord, he fell right into God and he acted as God. Then he gave his message which was God speaking through him, thus saith the Lord. But we've shown, and you can go back and take a look at the, the many, many videos that we have, we've shown where William Branham's thus saith the Lord failed. William Branham said thus saith the Lord 1,616 times in over 1,100 sermons. And we've documented and we've shown Donnie Morton, the healing of Donnie Morton is an example. There's a video that Rod Bergen just did recently that talks about the healing of Donnie Morton. It includes some information from Donnie's sister, a great watch. You should go take a look. There's also Sylvia Perkins' story about her mother not being healed, although William Branham told her, thus saith the Lord. Lots and lots of instances that we've documented and we've shown where William Branham has said, thus saith the Lord, where he put himself in the position, that's his self-proclaimed scriptural authority as a prophet of God that failed. And we know what how we know how scripture talks about that. First Samuel chapter three. 
And he talks about that and he says, the nation of Israel knew that Samuel was a prophet, established as a prophet of God because God let none of his words fall to the ground. When thus saith the word fails, William Branham here tells us that he's taking the place of God. And yet we see thus saith the Lord fail over and over and over again. In the case of the brown bear vision, in the case of the, the trip to South Africa and on and on and on. So we see that here, William Branham telling us that thus saith the Lord, you know, makes him a prophet. But what did others say about William Branham? And this is interesting because a lot of people say, well, nobody ever questioned William Branham while he was ministering. Nobody ever had any harsh words. You see, you guys, you come later and you try to destroy the prophet, our prophet, by saying, oh my gosh, he's done all these bad things. Why was it nobody showed up while he was there and tested these things because Branham said that they couldn't? Well, let's take a look here. This is about Erm Baxter. Now, there's a link here to an article on the Believe the Sign website about Ern Baxter. Ern Baxter was a minister who accompanied William Branham on many campaigns between 1947 and 1953. William Branham's meetings were often called the Baxter-Branham meetings, as Ern Baxter would often preach at those meetings as well. He also acted as William Branham's campaign manager during these years. William Branham mentioned him mentioned that it was the angel of the Lord that led him to contact Ern Baxter and have him accompany William Branham during his early healing campaigns. Now, we're going to take a look specifically at an excerpt uh, of an of a interview that Ern Baxter gave to the New Wine magazine. It's from Christian Growth Ministries, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And and the link there to the Believe the Sign website takes you directly to the information about the article and takes you to the rest of that interview. But we're going to just address two of the questions that were asked to Earn Baxter. What brought William Branham's ministry to a close was the question. And the answer, this is Earn Baxter speaking. I believe there's a Bible principle involved. No matter who we are, if we don't relate to the principles of truth, we pay for it. We either fall on it and break in repentance, or it falls on us and breaks us in judgment. The measure of faith Paul talks about in Romans 12, where he says, To each man is given according a measure of faith. He that prophesieth, let him prophesy according to the measure of faith, indicates that we all have been given a grace gift, but we must walk within the confines of our gift. For instance, if a miracle worker who may be used might mightily in work in working miracles steps over the boundaries of that gift and presumes to be a teacher when God has not called him to teach, then he is violating the rule of walking within his grace. Ern Baxter continues, Branham saw himself as a teacher of some kind of in truth. To me, some of it was quite esoteric. I became aware early in his ministry that there was a mixture. I urged him not to say some things in, in public. As long as we worked together, he refrained. One of the reasons for my leaving him was that he was starting to say some seriously wrong things. When that, coupled with other circumstances, eventually became unbearable, I resigned. I think there can be a lesson in this. Branham as a miracle worker had a real place. Branham as a teacher was outside of his calling. The fruits of his teaching ministry are not good. Remember now, this isn't Tim Krause. This is Ern Baxter, who was Branham's campaign manager from 1947 through 1953. And this is where he's talking about William Branham getting out of his lane and basically taking on the roles that he had no business taking on. If William Branham had talked about himself as an evangelist, we wouldn't be having this discussion. But William Branham and message ministers talk about William Branham as a prophet of God. He doesn't qualify as a prophet of God, according to scriptural examination. And Ern Baxter is the first one to acknowledge this in this article that he gave to, to this magazine, New Wine, the, the New Wine magazine. So let's take a look at the second question that was asked that that we're going to take out of that interview. Question was, what do you think is one of the main things that we can learn from the healing revival and the ministry of Branham and others? This is the answer. 
That's an excellent question. I think we need to learn out of it absolute mandatory nature of the principle of plurality. No man, no matter how gifted, can afford to violate plurality and walk alone. Number two, I would say it points up the great necessity of staying in your calling or gift and not making use of whatever accrues to you from that gift to get into other areas. I think it also points up the needs of having responsible community to receive the fruits of this kind of evangelistic ministry. If the converts are not brought into a New, Test New Testament biblical community or church, they become followers of a man who cannot develop them into maturity. I believe these basics are very simple, or these principles are very basic. In addition, man does not live by miracles alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Miracles and signs, arid wonders, are not food. They are signs to tell you where the food is. If you try to live on the signs, you'll get an unbalanced nutrition. And we see, and that's what that's our ba Baxter's answer. We also see, by the way, lots and lots of <laughs> scripture, and we've shown these before. Jesus Christ himself says, you can heal in my name. You can cast out demons in my name. You can go evangelize in my name. But when you show up and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do that? Depart from me, you lawbreakers. I never knew you. It's not important that you know God. It's important that God knows you. And he knows you by the gifts that he's given you and why you stay within your gifts. Here we have, now let, let's talk about this a little bit more about our idolatry. We're going to show some pretty amazing pictures here. There, these are churches around the world. You can see a gentleman here on his knees, head down to the ground. He is worshiping the photo of William Branham from the Houston arena that shows the ceiling light on his head that everybody claims is the supernatural being. We dealt with that a couple of videos ago when we talked specifically about this. But we can see here, this guy is on his knees worshiping the photograph of William Branham. Now that's not God that he's dealing with. You, you, you know, it's interesting that a lot of the message minister calls call out Catholics. Catholics believe that you should pray in order. You should pray to your guardian angel. You should pray to whatever saint is involved in whatever you're doing. You can even pray to the, you know, pray to the Virgin Mother, uh, you know, because she is, uh, because, you know, she can take your message directly to God. And we scoff and laugh Message ministers scoff and laugh at the Catholic Church and say, oh my gosh, that's idolatry. Oh my gosh, that's got nothing to do with Christianity. Here this young man is on his knees with his head down in front of a picture of William Branham worshiping. Now that's a disturbing photograph. But wait, there's more. Here we've got another young man in an African assembly. Notice how he is kneeling with his hands lifted up in praise to the picture of William Branham acting as his intercessor between God and this person. Acting as an intercessor between God and this person. And that's unscriptural. Salvation doesn't come through an intercessor. Salvation comes from a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus Christ, not through an intercessor or a prophet of God. That's old scriptural thinking. That's old covenant thinking. And Rod Bergen just did a great video on the new covenant. You can find that on the Believe the Sign YouTube page. Here we have, and this, I'm going to get even more shocking to you. It's not just William Branham who is, who, who people are, idolize. It isn't just William Branham. Here, here's a declaration by two message believers who worship Edgar Hill Roscoe of the El Tabernacle, Johannesburg, South Africa. Here's one guy's name, 1st September 2017. Yes, we worship Edgar Hill Roscoe, is there a problem? Tell us, we will tell you that in Israel they worship David and God at the same time. I love it because I balance, I read 100% Bible and spoken word this massage, he meant message, groups, only read the spoken word. Yes, we worship Edgar Hill Roscoe. And he asks, is there a problem? Here's another guy, January the 6th, 2016. Amen. May Jehovah Roscoe. May Jehovah Roscoe. 
Bless you all, bride. Amen. Shalom. Now here's the pit, the picture. You see the picture here, and it's got a light. It looks like it's a double exposed light, which is very common. We see this all the time from message believers who want to tell us that their particular pastor or their particular assembly is particularly imbued or gifted with the Holy Spirit. So they produce a double exposed negative. Here we've got a, a light here on the right hand side. They tell us that this is a, you know, this is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, much like the halo picture of William Branham. And they say, don't fear, go tell your enemies. E.H. Roscoe is God. Now we didn't put that there. Okay. that we We didn't layer that over the top of that. This is from people who believe in him. This is from the guy that wrote the 6th January 2016. Jehovah Roscoe, go tell your enemies E.H. Roscoe is God. Now, if that's not undue loyalty to your leadership, I, I don't know what it is. If those pictures, all three of those pictures, if they don't show undue loyalty to leadership, I don't know what it is. I don't know what that shows. Let's take a look at at uh, what Scripture says, because we go back to Scripture. We're all about Scripture, all right? Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. We go backwards and forwards. We're all about Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Now, brothers, I've applied these things to myself and Apollo, for your benefit, so that you may learn from us, saying nothing beyond what is written. The purpose is that none of you will be inflated with pride in favor of one person over another. In, in other words, no anti scriptural, no extra scriptural, nothing beyond what is written. That's the Apostle Paul. And didn't Branham say that he taught everything Paul taught? You only taught what Paul taught, remember? Nothing beyond what is written. So that none of you will be inflated with pride in favor of one person over another. You think William Branham is in favor of one person over another? Certainly if you watch the videos of the uh, of the uh, message minister, certainly if you take a look at those two photos that we just saw where people are worshiping him and praying to him, he is inflated over in favor of one person over another. Here we have Isaiah chapter 45, verse 20. Come gather together and draw near, you fugitives of the nations, those who carry their wooden idols and pray to a God who cannot save, have no knowledge. In other words, William Branham can't save you. These guys are worshiping William Branham. They are, William Branham has become the intercessor between them and God. If you're praying to William Branham, then you're not praying to Jesus Christ. Your salvation's not based in Jesus Christ. That's a problem. Here we have Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. But in the past, when you didn't know God, you were enslaved by things that by nature are not God's. But now, since you know God, or rather have become known by God... How can you turn back again to the weak and bankrupt elemental forces? Do you want to be enslaved to them all over again? Here the Apostle Paul is saying, guys, you were enslaved by things that, you know, you were, you were praising idols. You want to go back to that? You want to go back to idolatry? Here we have Galatians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and any similar anything similar. I tell you about these things in advance, as I told you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Idolatry, verse 20. When you're kneeling in worship of a photo of William Branham, wow. When you're saying, my pastor, Roscoe, Jehovah Roscoe, 
is God. Wow. Now, what about the foolish virgins? Because that's the that's the proof text that William Branham uses. You, boy, you could do a whole sermon, and I I promise I will do my best not to preach a sermon about the foolish virgins. But I cannot go without taking a look at some of the scriptures that relate to it. Romans. You see, here here are some of the points about the 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 foolish virgins. You see, it's inside is what is inside the lamp that matters. So if your lamp is empty, if you're empty, assume that you're the lamp. If you're lamp, if you're the lamp and you are empty, then you've got a problem when the when the bridegroom comes and we're in the the great takening as Paul describes it, the rapture if you will. Here we've got uh Romans 8. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God lives in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, let's talk about the the lamp being each individual Christian, that is, somebody who comes to Christ for salvation, and then they do not repent to be baptized in obedience to the word for the repentance of or to the remission of their sins, according to Acts chapter 2, Peter tells us, repent, be baptized for the remission of sins, and you will receive the Holy Ghost. Okay? So if you just say, yeah, yeah, God, great thing. If you just come to church, if you just do those things, but don't fill yourself with the Holy Spirit. If you, the vessel which are the lamp, don't fill yourself full of the Holy Spirit, which is the oil, then you don't belong to him. Galatians 5, chapter chapter 5, verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Without the Holy Spirit of the oil, as mentioned in this parable of the ten versions, you're an empty lamp. It doesn't matter how good the lamp looks on the outside. You need to have the Holy Spirit on the inside. So what does that mean, though? It's inside the lamp that matters. We've got churches who, as an example, boy, their rules are, boy, are their, boy, you got to wear this kind of dress down past your ankle. You you can't, you know, you got to not wear makeup. Your hair has to be a certain way. It's all about the outside of the lamp, right? It's all about the outside of the lamp. What's inside the lamp? And that, you see, according to Galatians and according to Romans, the inside of the lamp is what's important here. Having the Holy Spirit is what's important. That's the oil. That's the lamp. That's the oil. You're the lamp, and the Holy Spirit's the oil. Now, you need oil to be ready for his coming. Acts chapter 2. 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying, and tongues like flames of fire were divided, appearing to them and resting on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different languages as the Spirit gave them the ability to speak. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the oil. Is Jesus Christ talking about sex? You see, because message ministers take the what the, those very narrow verse seven through ten, and they say this segregates or this separates the bride from the regular church. It's not about separation. That's not what that verse is. That what that scripture is about. It isn't about elevating the bride. It's about filling the lamp. You're the lamp. It's about filling the lamp. You need to be full of oil to be ready for his coming. You need to have the Holy Spirit in order to get ready for his coming. It isn't about separating ourselves. It's about filling ourselves with oil. Here we have this, by the way, seven virgins or the five virgins is a parable about the rapture, in case you you missed it. In our story, notice that the virgins got tired and fell asleep. In the Bible, to fall asleep can also be a reference to dying. After they sleep, they were awoken by a cry that rang out. When the cry came, those who were ready went into the banquet with the bridegroom, and those who were not ready got locked out. 
It's the picture of the rapture. Now, consider what Paul said in Thessalonians. You'll notice some parallels here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and again, this is the Apostle Paul talking, in the same way God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. For we say this to you by a revelation from the Lord. We, who are still alive in the Lord's coming, will certainly have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep. Isn't that interesting? We who are still alive at the Lord's coming, will have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep. That's what the Apostle Paul tells us. And yet, William Branham and his ministers use verses 7 through 10 in, about, in that parable about the foolish brides to say this is about a separation. And yet, Paul tells us, we who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep. And didn't Branham say that he only taught what Paul taught? Let's go on here. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and then with the trumpet, and the dead in Christ will be rise first. He's telling us exactly how this is going to happen. The shout, archangel's voice, trumpet of God, the dead will be the first to rise. Then we who are still alive will be caught up together. Not we who are awake and not asleep. We who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air, so we will always be with the Lord. Then we who are still alive, not those of us who are asleep or awake, and the guy, the guys that are asleep, they're going to go away. This clarifies that entire issue for it, doesn't it? Therefore, encourage one another in these words. Don't tell people, you know what, you're not going to make it because you don't have this message. Quit telling people separation is the important thing, because it's not. Here we have the Apostle Paul telling us this. Believe in the Lord. Get salvation through Jesus Christ. Come to the Lord. Be baptized for the remission of your sin. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. You're the lamp. Receive the oil of the Holy Spirit. Now, and this is the interesting thing. You see, to me... This is the essence of it. It's the greatest question in life. I think one of the most stunning statements in this entire, entire story is in verse 12. But let's read it together. Starting with verse 1, because because message ministers start too late and end too early. Let's go all the way through it, starting at verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. Five of them were foolish and five were sensible. When the foolish took their lamps, they did, didn't did take oil, olive oil with them. But the sensible ones took oil in their flasks with their lamps. Since the groom was delayed, they all became drowsy, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. In the middle of the night, there was a shout. What, did we, what do we know from the verse that we read in Thessalonians? Christ will descend from heaven with a shout. So here's what we have. In the middle of the night, there was a shout. Here's the groom. Come out to meet him. Then all of those versions, all of those versions got up and trimmed their lamps. But the foolish ones said to the sensible ones, give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. Their lamps were not full of oil. It's not about separating. It's about making sure that the lamps are full of oil. Holy Spirit, full of oil. Remember what Paul said? The sensible ones answered, No, there won't be enough for us and you. Go outside to those who go instead to those who sell and buy oil for yourselves. When they had gone to buy some, the groom arrived. Then those who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Now, that's where Branham and his ministers end. Because to them, it's about door shut, you're outside, we're inside, we're, we're the wise versions, you're the foolish versions, because you don't have the message. But let's take a look. Later, 
The rest of the virgins also came and said, Master, Master, open up for us. But he replied, I assure you, I do not know you. Do we remember when in the book of Matthew, everybody came and said, didn't we? Hey, didn't we perform miracles in your name? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we prophesy in your name? And the Lord says, depart from me. I never knew you. How do we get known by Jesus? We get known by God by filling ourselves with the Holy Spirit, submitting to his word and his authority. That's how we get full. That's how Christ knows us. If you remember also, earlier we, we saw the, the in the scripture where Paul said, you know, when you came to know God, or more importantly, when God came to know you, do you want to return to that idolatry? Do you want to return to that and, and you know, place a human intercessor between you and God once again? Therefore, be alert because you know don't know either the day or the hour. So you see Branham and his ministers start too early or start too late and end too early. Imagine the virgins hearing these words and the shock when they were hit with this reality. This is not the first time Jesus used this phrase, of I don't know you. If you remember the Sermon on the Mount, he said on that day there will be many people who had done things in Jesus' name. Yet his response to them will be, depart from me, I never knew you. This leads me to believe the greatest question in his life is not, do you know Jesus? The greatest question in life is, does Jesus know you? Jesus knowing you has nothing to do with your deeds or actions or who you worship as an intermediary. Jesus knowing you has to do with you putting your trust in him as Lord and Savior, filling your lamp full of oil, receiving the Holy Spirit and submitting yourself to his authority. Now these, these scriptures were never more, more important. Matthew 24, 24 through 28, false messiahs, and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders and lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Now, we hear this all the time. People say, oh, my gosh, you can't fool us. You're not going to lead astray the elect. Uh-uh. We don't claim to be messiahs or prophets. We claim none of that. We point people genuinely back to Jesus Christ and salvation through Christ and baptism for the remission of sin and baptism in the Holy Spirit. Take note goes on verse 25 i have told you in advance so if they tell you look he's in the wilderness don't go out look he's in the inner rooms do not believe it for as the lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west so will be the coming of the son of man remember the son of man jesus wherever the carcass is there the vultures will gather here's matthew 7 15 and 23 beware the and this is what they were talking about what what we were talking about earlier this is in the, the Sermon on the Mount. Beware the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. Beware of false prophets. You'll recognize them by the fruits. We're told all the time, we re you guys, oh, we're, we recognize you by your fruits. You're backslid, you're reprobate, blah, blah, blah. That's not what the scripture says. This scripture says, beware of false prophets. You'll recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or fig from thistles in the same way every good tree produces good fruit but a bad tree produces bad fruit a good tree can't produce bad fruit neither can a bad tree produce good fruit e every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire so you'll recognize them by their fruit not believers not people false prophets people who declare themselves as prophets of god who are false who do not qualify as prophets of god who come in sheep's clothing, but inward, inwardly are ravaging wolves. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Thus saith the Lord, 1,616 times in over 1,100 sermons. I'm a prophet of God, 400 times, over 400 times and over 1,100 sermons. Didn't we drive out demons in your name, signs and wonders? 
prayer lines and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you depart from me, you lawbreakers. Because they taught things that take us, they taught extra and anti-scriptural things. William Branham taught things that take us away from, from the word of God. When they take us away from the word of God, we're told, we're told by, we're given instructions by the Apostle Paul himself about what we should do when we come across a doctrine which teaches something other than that which is taught by Scripture, anti-scriptural or extra-scriptural things. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men, corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. So, we've seen how the, the message of William Branham, particularly when it comes to teaching things that are extra and anti-scriptural, when it comes to separating themselves from the rest of the church, when it comes to giving undue authority to leadership above everything else or above everybody else, we see how the message of William Branham, whether the message ministers want to believe it or not, the message of winners, it, it, the, 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 the qualifications of a cult are embraced by the, by the ministers of William Branham, by the people of William Branham, when they kneel down with their heads on the ground and pray to a picture of William Branham. When they say that Roscoe, Jehovah Roscoe is God, and we shouldn't be afraid of that. When message ministers tell us, that we, unless we have the message of William Branham, we don't have the rapture, which is completely extra-scriptural. It's anti-scriptural at best. We've seen Paul the Apostle tell us in Thessalonians where that's absolutely untrue. So, we listen, I'm done with this series now, and I'm going to continue to do other videos. It may be a little bit because I've got some things on my plate. I'm busy much like the rest of you, I would think. But I just wanted to say to everybody, God bless you, and I'm glad that 2022 is, is uh, better than 2021. I pray that it is for everybody here. But, you know, my wife and I, we pray for you. Uh, we want to thank you for listening and paying attention to us. And we are grateful to you for giving us the opportunity to come into your homes or come into your cars or come into your come into to your places of work and, and talk to you about this. So God bless you. I hope 2021 works for everybody. And if there's anything else we can do, the end card will tell you how to get in contact with you, with us. God bless you now. Bye-bye.